Hey everybody, Jason here again with gd &T Basics. And on today's video question line, our topic is how to inspect true position at an angle. So today's question was, how do I inspect the position callout for the hole that's at an angle with respect to the primary datum? And more specifically, uh, at an angle that isn't 90 or 180 degrees, right? Uh, typically, when we have drawings where the hole in question being controlled with position, like you see in this example here, the primary datum is more often than not the surface that the hole originates from, right? So we're controlling the perpendicularity back to that primary datum. And then usually the secondary and tertiary datums are perpendicular or parallel as well. But as you can see in this scenario here, the primary datum as well as the secondary datum and the tertiary datum create a bit of a unique datum reference frame to measure with respect to. More specifically, the relationship between the axis we're controlling and the primary datum, right? Um, we can trig that orientation to be 30 degrees based off our basic dimensions, right? Uh, and so we see that this gets a little bit tricky. Uh, how do you inspect the location of this angled feature with respect to the uh, datum reference frame? A quick first setup might look something like this. Uh, we could use a 30 degree angle block, right, to set our datum feature, uh, add an orientation with respect to our inspection surface, right, our granite table with our height gauge on it, and then we can come and inspect the vertical distance of this hole back to uh, a, a known angled surface with respect to our datum plane. This is fully simulating uh, datum plane A, right? And in fact, if we were checking angularity, this would be perfect. This would be exactly how we check angularity. However, we're checking location as well, not just orientation. Uh, and so we need to utilize the other uh, datum references to create a 0, 0, 0. And datum B and C here are used to give us a 0, 0, 0 point here. And so we need to fully simulate B and C as well. Uh, B is going to be this back surface over here, so we could easily use something like a gauge block to slide this part into the page here and stop that degree of translation and rotation. So that's a pretty easy one to inspect. Um, we're going to ignore the effects of B for the right now because it is easy to set up and inspect. Um, but C is going to also give us a locational aspect. And if we have this set up here and datum feature C goes off at an angle like this, um, really, datum C is down here, right? Datum A being the surface. Datum C is perpendicular to datum A. And so datum C would be here giving us our 0, 0, 0 right here, not here at the surface. And so if that's the case, if that surface does tip out, uh, we need to make sure to inspect it with that in mind, right? And so we need to fully simulate datum C off of datum feature C. And so something like a sign plate would help us out with that. And again, uh, we could put a stop at the end of this part here to fully uh, simulate datum C. Again, this being perpendicular to datum A. So we're simulating those perpendicularity. We're simulating that datum reference frame being uh, created here in this feature control frame. And that's going to capture and give us a 0, 0, 0 to work with, right? Uh, and then we can go ahead and find the location of this hole with respect to that 0, 0, 0. Um, but you might notice one inherent flaw here when we get to the physical world of trying to inspect this part. You can't zero, zero, zero uh, your height gauge. You can't get a zero point uh, using this um, intersection of these two planes here, right? If you put your probe down there, it won't settle down inside there. So you have to do some trig and use a pin uh, in order to offset your zero. And we'll show you how you can do that here. So if we zoom in on the part and we put a pin of known diameter, right? We are after essentially X, and that is the offset that we need to take into account when we measure the location of that hole. So X is what we're after. We know the diameter of this, so we can divide it by two to get the radius. That's gonna be a helpful variable in our trigonometry here. And we're really after the center of that pin with respect to our ideal zero zero right if we can get this value right here well we can just add the radius of our gauge pin to get x right uh, so really what we're after is trying to figure out how to calculate that vertical distance right there 
but we don't know the distance of this hypotenuse here. We don't know that value. We need to be able to calculate that value. We do know this angle here to be 30, but we don't know this hypotenuse. And so we can't figure out what this is. And we don't know what this leg is either. So we're gonna build a smaller triangle to kind of piece out this larger hypotenuse. So if we build this smaller triangle down here, right? Well, we do know this value from here to here. This value right here is our radius right there. That is the value of the one leg of our smaller triangle. And we know the angle here is 30. So now we can calculate this shorter leg right here. And that helps build this, the larger hypotenuse. So we'll call that shorter leg Q. Uh, we know R to be the radius of our gauge pin. And so we can calculate based on tangent theta or tangent of our angle equals Q over R. If you remember SOHCAHTOA, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So we can rearrange that to calculate for Q. And again, Q is this short leg of the larger triangle's hypotenuse, right? So the short leg here is Q. And that's what we're after to try and help build that larger hypotenuse. So we have Q that we can store away. We can calculate Q. We know R and we know theta or the angle uh, of our feature, right? And so then we're still back to that larger hypotenuse that we're after. This hypotenuse can be easily seen as Q plus r because this is r the radius of our gauge pin and q we just showed you how to calculate so we can get q and r to the hypotenuse and again we're still after that z so if we're after that z and we know this angle to be 30 we can easily calculate z again cosine since it's the adjacent over the hypotenuse or z over r plus q is equal to the cosine of our angle so we can rearrange that to be z cosine of our angle times r plus q. So get rid of some of my pen here. We can quickly calculate x to be equal to r plus z, right? So x equals r plus z. So we can go ahead and plug in some values here. If we plug in this for z, we get x equals r plus cosine of our angle times r plus q. Well, we also know what Q is, right? We calculated Q here based off of our known variables of R and our angle. And so we can go ahead and plug that into this equation as well. And we can get a total value of X, the offset that we're needing to take into account when we do our measurement based off the top of this pin, X is going to make sure we offset down by the value of R plus cosine of our angle times R plus R tangent of our angle as well. And again, these are the variables we know. We know R and we know our angle. So if we know R and we know our angle, we can calculate X using this trick. Now, if you are friends with somebody that has CAD software, this becomes a lot easier. You don't even need to do the trig. You just draw this up uh, and you can spit this out. But this is something nice and handy to have in the inspection process to say, hey, use a 0.5 gauge pin and make sure to offset this value, right? You don't need to do this every time you make the inspection. You just need to know out of the gate, uh, if I use a 0.5 pin, I need to make sure to offset this much. Uh, that's a, a one-time calculation, um, and it's nice to put it somewhere in the notes in your inspection process so you don't have to do it again. But again, this is uh, you can trig this out to figure out the offset off of the top of your pin. So now we zero our height gauge off of this, uh, and then we move down this nominal value that we just calculated and then re-zero out. So now we are taking our zero of our height gauge with respect to the intersection of these two planes, our zero, zero, zero defined by A, B, and C, right? So we have that vertical distance now that we can calculate and we can easily calculate that vertical distance. We know where it should be based off uh, basic dimensions or the CAD model. Uh, and then we can calculate our, di our deviation from where it should have been. And really once we have our y deviation in this direction, we can have another simple setup that simulates A and B uh, on its side and we can get the deviation of this hole in this direction as well with respect to B. And once we're able to get the deviation in this direction as well as this direction, uh, we can use those two deviations to calculate the diametric deviation for that point in that cylinder, right? So if you have one deviation that's A here and we have a deviation B here, well, we can calculate where the axis of that hole went, right? We can get a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Uh, if you multiply that value by two, you get your diametric deviation. And as long as your diametric deviation is less than the tolerance allowed diametrically, uh, that point 
that you calculated based on this deviation and this deviation passes, right? But that's just one point down the depth of this cylinder, right? So let's say we took points here and here on this side. We want to take points here and here as well to make sure that the entire axis is being checked, right? If we were to just measure one point uh, here, the vertical distance to get the center point, uh, that's not enough. We want to make sure to do another point over here. So we would have y value 1 and we'd have y value 2. And we do the same thing in the other direction, in and out of the page, right? We would have x value 1 and x value 2. And we would do a c1, c2, uh, and the, that diametric deviation for each one of these, right? So we would get center points uh, here in both x and y. You can connect those two theoretically in your head, with, make an axis from our feature. Um, and now we're ensuring that entire axis of the feature lands inside this diametric tolerance of 10 thousandths. Um, and again, we split hairs uh, depending on the size of the cylinder, the type of cylinder, the inspection, the process, the accuracy that you're after. Um, but in reality, you should be using a best fit pin here to measure off of that as well uh, to make sure to simulate the UAME of that envelope. And that in that scenario, you wanna take points as close to the surface here in here as well on either side of the pin to take take into account the entire axis of the whole feature uh, that's then derived from that UAME. So that best fit cylinder, that best fit gauge pin gives us that UAME, the unrelated actual mating envelope cylinder, uh, and then we can measure off that cylinder to create a theoretical axis. Um, so again, we dive into this in all of our courses, uh, specifically the fundamentals we show you how to uh, um, interpret position feature control frames and how to calculate diametric deviations. Uh, also in our inspection course, we show you how to do setups like this uh, and, and get reportable values and what's necessary to uh, put on an inspection report to either pass or fail this feature. So once again, thanks for joining us. Hopefully this clarified some things for you. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Our goal is to be your best source for gd &T information online. It's important to us that everyone involved in engineering and manufacturing have the chance to learn and better understand gd &T on your prints. We have many free resources to help you get started on your learning journey. Subscribe to our gd &T community using the link in the description below or visit our website. Test your knowledge with our gd &T and print reading quizzes. Download helpful charts and access articles written by training experts.